Welcome to this Eurogas Tech Talk, where we look at the technologies in Europe that can help decarbonize energy systems and create jobs on the continent. My name is Philippa Nuttall-Jones, and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Energy Monitor. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to Torbjörg Clara Fossum, who is Vice President, Global CCS Solutions at Equinor. CCS remains a relatively controversial uh, technology and, and the role it can actually play in the energy transition. Perhaps to start, you can explain to us a little bit more exactly what we're talking about here and the potential you see for it in the energy transition. So first of all, uh, CCS is, you know, it is a climate mitigating tool and it is essential to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the solution, it prevents the CO2 to reach the atmosphere and by that also contributing to reducing the global warming. And the way it works is that CO2, it is captured at the emission source, and then it's uh, pumped deep into the ground for permanent storage. And, and, and the, the reservoir is kind of reservoir that the nature itself has developed. And it's the same kind of reservoir that has uh, kept oil and gas trapped for millions of years. And if you look at uh, into 2050, we're going to need quite significant amount of CCS. Uh, gigatons of CO2, CO2 needs to be stored every year to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that is basically the message from all modeling work that is consistent with a sustainable development. And some of you may have noticed that IEA, the International Energy Agency, came out with, with a new report, Net Zero by 2050 Pathway. And they indicate that 6, 7.6 gigaton of CO2 must be captured and stored every year in, in uh, 2050. So CCS is important. I've been a climate and energy journalist for, for over 20 years now. And we've been talking about CCS for, for a, a, probably the same amount of time. And often we don't really feel as if the discussion has moved on. Is CCS now a proven technology and can it really work? CCS has been in operation since the 1970s in in US, and, and not everybody is aware of that. And and if you look at the number of CCS projects in the world, they are increasing for the third year in a row, and there are more than 20 projects in operation. And Global CCS Institute they report that um, the current momentum for CCS is driven by more and more nations and industries that uh, have uh, announced net zero ambitions. And with net zero ambition, CCS is a prerequisite. Uh, and also among those uh, CCS projects in the world, you will find that Equinor operates two of them, Sleipner and Snöret. And these projects are quite unique because we inject CO2 offshore. And um, we started the injection on, on uh, Sleipner 25 years ago. So so this year is, is quite a, a milestone uh, from that perspective. Uh, and um, from our own CCS uh, operation, we know that the technology works and that CCS uh, can be done in a safe and efficient manner. And also that we can, uh, can build on the competence and the skills that we have developed from, from the oil and gas business. And is there enough capacity um, under the sea or elsewhere to be able to store all this CO2? Yes, there is. Uh, the geological uh, storage capacity is, is really not a limitation. In the North Sea uh, Basin, it's estimated to have 200 gigaton storage capacity. If you look around the world, you will see other locations with even higher capacity. It's not considered to be um, a limitation at all. Equinor is part of the Northern Lights project, which is seen as a very much as a flagship project, which will kind of prove what you said is true and that CCS can work, or if it doesn't work, it will, it will obviously leave a bit of a hole in terms of whether the technology works. Can you explain a bit more about this project and why it's so important? Northern Lights is about offering a CO2 transport and storage service to emitters that want to capture their emissions and need somebody to take care of the CO2. And if you imagine the CCS value chain, industry can capture the CO2 from the significant emission source and bring it to the harbor. And then Northern Lights will collect it by ship and bring it to Norway, uh, to a terminal close to Bergen. Uh, and then the CO2 will be pumped from the receiving terminal through a pipeline uh, and, and uh, to an injection well. And then the CO2 will be injected like several kilometers beneath the seabed. Where, where it will be stored permanent and safe. Industries as, as steel and cement, 
they are important for the global economy. Now, if you look at cement, the global emissions from cement, they stand for 5 to 8% of the emissions. And with CCS and with such solutions, uh, this industry can dramatically uh, reduce the emissions. And at what stage is the Northern Lights project at? When will it actually be up and running? So the construction work is ongoing and uh, the project will be ready for the first injection in 2024. Equinor is, um, is leading the development of the project that will get Northern Lights ready for the first CO2 injection in 2024. And then also a joint venture is established, uh, which um, is called Northern Lights Joint Venture, <laughs> with three equal owners, uh, Shell, Total and Equinor. And the joint venture will be the operator of the transport and storage facilities, and they will further grow the customer base that will actually use these facilities. And they will also expand the injection facilities as more industries uh, take an interest in, in uh, using the, the service. And what other CCS projects is uh, Equinor involved in at the moment? We have an ambition of being climate neutral by 2050. So that means that we will have to remove the same amount of CO2 from the atmosphere that is emitted from the use of our products. And, and to achieve this, CCS is an important tool. And we are developing projects where we can offer a CO2 transport and storage service the way we do it in Northern Lights. And then we also are developing projects where we can combine CCS with reforming natural gas to hydrogen. Uh, and with that, we can actually offer clean or blue hydrogen at scale to the energy intensive segments. And the projects that we are developing uh, are in nations with uh, supportive policy framework. So, so UK and Norway is important and in many ways are, are leading the way. Uh, and in UK, we are partner in the Northern Endurance Partnership, which is another CO2 transport and storage development as Northern Lights, but it's different because it's based on pipeline solution and it's based on decarbonizing uh, two large uh, industrial clusters in UK, Humber and Teesside. And these two industrial clusters, they stand for more than 50% of the industrial emissions in the UK. But we are also developing other projects in, in Norway and Netherlands and Germany. And in Germany, we are working together with Tussenkopf Steel. And we are evaluating the opportunity to replace coal with blue hydrogen in the steel making process. And, and that will dramatically reduce the emission. You've mentioned blue hydrogen several times. So hydrogen that's made from natural gas with uh, carbon capture and storage. Why is Equinor not looking more to green hydrogen, which would be made from renewables and which would be cleaner than, than blue hydrogen? We are actually looking at both. We are also developing green hydrogen, which is uh, based on electrolysis. Uh, and we think in the long term, it will be a green electrolysis that will be dominating. But to reach the scale that is required in the time available, uh, blue hydrogen gives uh, a, a unique opportunity. And if you say that the, the technology is there, what about the economics of it? Because it still remains uh, relatively expensive as a technology. You're right. It is kind of a, an add-on cost to industry that wants to decarbonize and use CCS. It is also clear that to get to net zero, to get to the uh, goals of the Paris Agreement, it comes with a cost. Uh, and the scenarios show that if you don't use CCS, uh, that will actually increase the cost 130 percentage. So... It comes with a cost, but um, it will be more expensive not to implement CCS than doing it. And will, at some stage, CCS, um, if it becomes more widespread, be able to become economically viable without subsidies, or will it always be a technology that needs to be subsidised to, to work? It will definitely be uh, a solution that will stand on its own uh, and, and don't need subsidies. So it needs subsidies in an, an initial phase like we've seen for uh, also renewable solution as solar and wind. Uh, but these first initial projects, they are essential because they develop uh, and test uh, the regulatory and the commercial framework. They are really building the industry and they are paving the way for a kind of standalone business on this. So it is uh, expected that the cost of emitting CO2 in combination with uh, a market for low carbon products, low carbon cement, low carbon steel, uh, and other factors will uh, link together and, and, and make this uh, a standalone business. 
And in terms of the dangers or the, the potential dangers that could be associated with storing CO2, are, are there dangers that it could leak? Uh, based on our own experience, uh, we know that CO2 storage and CO2 management can be done in a safe and controlled manner. And I think the starting point is really to identify and qualify the suitable CO2 storage complex, if you like. And in this work, we, we, we have to build on the experience uh, and the data from oil and gas. And there is two methods that, uh, uh, that is important when you identify the storage and when you qualify it. And that is that you have this ceiling cap rock on top of the permeable sand layer. So the CO2 is then stored between the, the pores in the sand and the cap rock pre prevents the CO2 from leaking. And once the, the CO2 complex is qualified, uh, then we also have to monitor it as we inject it. And one way of monitoring it is to monitor the pressure to make sure that we, we keep it, uh, within the strength of the cap rock. But another method is based on seismic technology, uh, which implies that the sound waves are directed to the, to the sea floor and to the ground. And then from the reflections, you can actually uh, uh, reveal the presence of CO2 and, and, and to understand how this works, uh, you can do your own little experiment. Then you will need two glasses, one with still water and one with sparkling water. And you know, sparkling water, that's the CO2 that is the sparkle. And then if you, if you gently, gently knock uh, with a spoon on the glasses, you want to propose a toast, you know. And, and then you will discover that there is a different sound on the still water compared to the sparkling water. So the sound from the still water is, is clearer, louder. And that is really because the CO2 in the sparkling water is muting the sound. And the same principle is used when you direct sound waves to the ground uh, and the CO2 will, will impact the reflection. And in that way, you can actually detect the CO2 and understand how the, how the CO2 plume is moving uh, and growing. And, and we have uh, some very good uh, experience from that, from the Sleipner field, uh, where we have uh, shared with public uh, how, how this actually looks and how we can detect it. How can we make sure that CCS is, is used for the energy transition? It's not used just to allow fossil fuel um, producers to continue to pollute, which uh, would be kind of um, in breach of what the IEA was saying in its net zero report and will definitely not get us to net zero by 2050. Maybe to reflect a little bit on the Northern Lights project to, to answer that question, because Northern Lights project is really all about offering a service to the industry, cement, steel, and so on. And if you look at the building blocks, I mean, a longship uh, is this Norwegian longship. It uh, has two key building blocks. It is the CO2 capture plant at the Norsem cement factory at the east coast of Norway, and it's Northern Lights. And, and this one is supported by the Norwegian government because it aims to kickstart CCS in Norway and in Europe. Uh, and the commercial framework uh, that has been agreed with the government is also giving incentives for Northern Lights to go out there and offer this CO2 transport and storage service to industries. And what we have seen is that there is really a lot of interest. When we decided on the pipeline dimension from the receiving facilities that received the ships to the injection well, there were no industries in Europe looking into CCS. Uh, but today, there is actually more than 60 industries. And if you look at the CO2 from these industries, you'll see it amount to 10 times the capacity of the pipeline, which is 5 million tons a year. And these industries, they, they, they have kind of been stimulated to look into CCS because now there is this infrastructure in place. And we see that... Um, uh, there are uh, there are large industries like our Heidelberg Group, the cement uh, producer, ArcelorMittal, the, the large steel producers, and then you have waste to energies. You have also refineries uh, that that have entered into MOUs with uh, memorandum of understanding with Northern Lights to ac actually explore how they can use this to decarbonize themselves. And we have also seen now recently interest outside the traditional industrial sectors, you know, big IT players that are, are keen to source net zero emission power supply. Uh, and CCS can actually be part of that. In October in 2020, Northern Lights entered into a memorandum of understanding with Microsoft. And Microsoft, they want to become climate neutral by 2030 and even make up for historic emissions in 2050. And then you need CCS. 
And so do you see this industry as a way of creating jobs uh, in Europe? Yes, but perhaps even more important is that uh, it enables transformations of existing industries to a low carbon industry. So you are protecting existing jobs. So CCS can enable industrial re regions in Europe to transform into low carbon regions. And do you feel in Europe that you have the, the policy support needed now to develop the, the industry at speed, given that for 20 years it doesn't seem that the industry has developed perhaps as fast as it should have done if it's going to be play its role in the energy transition? I think uh, there is still a way to go. Uh, and we've gained quite some interesting uh, insight on that through our conversation with industries uh, in Europe through our Northern Lights project, if you like. And, and I would say from the conversation, it is clear that ETS, the cost of emitting is a strong driver, of course. Back in uh, 2017, which were the early days of Northern Lights, the ETS price were, was like four euro per ton. And, and now recently it hit over 50 euro per ton. So it, it, is, it is definitely getting more expensive to emit. Uh, but we also see that um, there are other drivers uh, for these industries, uh, such as setting uh, voluntary ambitions. And these industries, they are doing that because uh, they want to be part of the low carbon society. And they also realize that this is what the investors want to see. They want to see the industry fit also in, in the low carbon society. And uh, some of the industries, they expect firmer regulation. Uh, and some expect a market for low carbon products such as low carbon cement and low carbon steel to grow. And, and what we have learned is that it is really essential for these industries that um, there is a CO2 transport and storage infrastructure in place so they can concentrate on capturing the emissions and somebody else can take care uh, of them. But as I said also, these initial CCS projects, they cannot be developed by industry alone simply before because there is uh, not enough incentives uh, at the moment. So they will have to be developed in a private-public partnership and some of them will need subsidies. And I think it is important to, to realize that these initial CCS projects, uh, they are so essential uh, and, and they need to be developed in, in a close collaboration with governments, with industry. They are really the pioneers. They are testing and developing the regulatory and the commercial framework and they are paving the way for the market and for the industry so that, you know, significant scale up of CCS can happen, uh, which is necessary to meet the goal of the Paris Agreement. Thank you for joining us today. That was Turbo Clara Fossum, Vice President of Global CCS Solutions at Equinor. If you want to watch more tech talks from Eurogas, you can go to Eurogas's website, eurogas.org.